We are a proud member of the 143 Podcast Network. The Cheers to Comics Podcast is proudly affiliated with NSCLiveTV.com. That's No Signal Comics. NSCLiveTV.com. Find the Cheers to Comics Podcast on channel 34 of NSCLiveTV.com. No Signal Comics. The best in auction action. Well, hello again, Slurds. Welcome back to the Cheers to Comics podcast. I am your host, Brian Wayne, and this is a wonderful Creator Corner. This Creator Corner, oh man, I don't know how to how to put it into words. I really don't. This guy's a legend. He's been a titan in the industry for, for uh, decades. Decades. Close to 30 years, if not over 30 years. Monty Michael Moore. He's he's a badass, man. He's a badass. I was so stoked to talk to him about this. Uh, throughout this podcast, we come up with all types of awesome ideas for his Loco Hero Kickstarter campaign. So, uh, yeah, you could say you heard it here first more than once throughout this podcast. So, I'm, uh, I'm excited for you all to check this out. I had a blasty blast talking with Monty. Before we dive into this interview, I've got to remind you to check out those who support this podcast. Support those that support this podcast, and by that I mean head on over to Hooked on Comics. Hooked on Comics. You can find them over at nsclivetv.com. You can throw them in your little search bar on Facebook. Jump into the Hooked on Comics page. You'll see the streams going up there. And the Cheers to Comics Facebook group. You'll also see Hooked on Comics feeds going up in there live. And they go live on... Tuesdays at 6 p.m. Eastern Time and 7 on Saturdays Eastern Time. So Tuesdays and Saturdays, 6 and 7, both Eastern Time. And when you tune into Hooked on Comics, you could expect the best in auction action. I know it's hard to get comics for a lot of people right now, so Hooked on Comics has you covered there. And it's everything from slabs to raw, and it's all just great stuff. It's great stuff. It's a great show, too. So once again, tune into Hooked on Comics Tuesdays and Thursdays at 6 and 7 Eastern Time. Now, without any further ado, I bring to you an awesome, awesome interview with Monty Michael Moore. Monty Michael Moore, how are you, man? I'm doing great. That's good to hear. That's staying very busy. <laughs> I can, I can imagine. imagine. I can imagine. I, imagine. I, think, I think the, the creators, creators are in one boat, boat just two boats, boats right now during, during this time. You're, you're either bored or you're busier than you've ever been. been. And, and uh, it's, it's good, good to hear that you're on the, the busy side, side of things. things. Um, I, know I know that you've got, got a lot of stuff going, going for you right, right now. You've got a big campaign, so we're definitely going to get to all of that. Yeah, it's it's interesting the way you know things came about, obviously, the pandemic that's going on and... Uh, I personally, I was finishing up a fine art show, a three month stint in Arizona, uh, that's outside of my comics work. And I had already had the Kickstarter and the, the project going for many years. I actually started it back in 2014. So my, I initially was going to launch the Kickstarter, uh, for Loco Hero in January and, I was very busy, and then four or five artists that I really wanted to do variant covers, it was just hard for them to get it in their schedule. It's a, it's a busy time of year, apparently. And so I was like, you know what? You guys are worth waiting for. So I just sort of kind of put it on hold. And then it was last Saturday uh, that I ended up speaking with uh, uh, Rob over at Indie Devil and Kevin at NSC, and they said, hey, if you're ready to go or close to ready to go, you should drop this thing in the hopper. And I was like, really? You think now is a good time? And they said, you know, people are home and they want to support creators. And, you know, I've now had five conventions cancel or reschedule. So this actually opens up my whole summer to be home in the studio to do fulfillment for the Kickstarter, which is, a you know, it's a difficult uh, task, especially when I'm offering commissions. I have to be able to put those commissions you know on the on the forefront to get them done in a timely manner for the backers 
That's awesome. Well, I mean, you, so you no problem staying busy at all. <laughs> even even with the cancellations, you you know how to fill the gap. And I I'm, I back Kevin's idea on this. You drop it now, because this is we're 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 itching, man. We need stuff. We need to be excited about stuff. And we know that if it's coming out on Kickstarter, we don't have to worry about the publishers pushing it back or anything like that. We know that we're gonna get this. We don't have to worry about Diamond or any of that crap. So I think it was a very wise move. Yeah, and I think that that's hearing that from them is sort of solidified for me that it was okay to go out and say, "Hey, by backing this project, you know, I'm asking you for money uh, to help it bring it to fruition." But really, from what I was hearing from you guys uh, in this side of the things is that um, the fans really want to support their creators right now, and they know that some of the creators, you know, especially with not being able to go on the road. That's a that's a very large part of their their uh, yearly income, and so this is a way for me to say, how do I replace the loss of potential income from going to San Diego, uh, Gen Con for gaming, Phoenix, Denver, Orlando, MegaCon? So you know, all these shows are either canceled or pushed. Yeah. Yeah, and it's uh people are figuring out how to adapt though to fill these things. We have, you know, the the virtual Comic-Con thing is just really taking off. There's CyberCon and then Mainframe Comic-Con and all these things are sparking up. So, um, I I uh, I think that's a good a good outlet too for creators to kind of still create that camaraderie and fill the space while everything is, you know, I mean, being figured out in the meantime. So, it's good to see that you're actually being a part of that whole circuit as well. Um well, like the one of the things that was neat about being at CyberCon uh, uh, last Saturday was you. All, I also got to meet some other creators. So normally, a lot of time you've been to many conventions. You know, there's artist alley tables. You're busy. You're going to dinner. You're trying to meet up with friends. But sometimes it's hard to connect. Sometimes with other fellow creators and writers, editors. So last weekend, CyberCon, I'm on a panel with four or five other great guys. And I'm immediately sending out friend requests and be like, oh, man, this guy does this. I could back his project. He's giving me a shout out. And it's a very community thing. And it's a it's a byproduct of a virtual con that maybe we're, we, we don't necessarily put out there as a as a byproduct of that. I, I might not have met all those guys otherwise. Yeah, I mean, it's it's hard to see people beyond the lines at your table, you know? You just see the fans. You don't see what, who's on the other end of that hallway a lot of times. And sometimes just on the other end of that hallway is Charlie Stickney or Sean Mar- Mullen or someone like that, someone great that, you know, he's, that, that connection is right there. But because of the physical world, it's missed. But be, this digital world, I mean, it's I think it's a good thing. I think it was a real positive thing, and I'd like to see more of that. I, I, I would. I think that the the sort of virtual and the connecting, not only like this, but directly to the fans and on Facebook and in groups, um, I think that the, the sort of worldwide pandemic is going to be the trigger and for certain uh, of people to be comfortable with it, both creators and fans, and somebody to say, hey, I'm an Australian. I'm going to stay up an extra four hours because I want to watch Monty's podcast. Now, I, uh, I might uh, not have done that, Otherwise, but if it becomes part of the norm where you're doing that once a week or you're on various shows, you, you really are, you're connecting with more fans, mm-hmm. just not in, in, a, in a physical way, but in a way you're also inviting them into your world. If it's a live event, maybe they get to see part of the studio. You can say, hey, check out this artwork that I normally wouldn't you know, take to a convention or here's my studio set up. And so um, you get to share a little bit more of your, you personally as an artist. I agree. I, I I agree. I think the doors are just wider, more wide open now in that in that scene than they've ever have been before. And even if physical conventions do come back, why not have both? You know, I I actually see more more creators wanting to you know cut back the cost of travel and all of that, and maybe do these things more uh, more over the internet. I see this becoming more of the the new norm. I do. Yeah, oh. we had uh, one of the first ones that I did that was like that was um, right when Emerald City was canceled, and I happened to be in Phoenix at the time. So Brian uh, Polito, who's the writer publisher for Lady Death, ends up having a virtual con there at his headquarters, and you know had three or four of us artists. We did art demos. Uh, we did um, uh, live sales events and that kind of thing, and it went off spectacular. Like at the level of commissions and remarks, 
that I was uh, at a convention, actually almost more so. Mm-hmm. And th- there was tons of work to do afterwards. It was fun during the day. And um, the, the fans still got to get exclusive that was offered to them. And they got a chance to go through the entire book. Like I went through my book that I would normally take to a convention that has originals and page by page we went through it. And, you know, 500 fans could see it all at once and say, ooh, I'll take that Terminator sketch. Yes, yes. It's it's awesome, man. It's awesome. Um, I know that we have a lot to talk about with Loco Hero. That's that's the big reason we're here. But uh, for some of the, the the newer listeners or listeners that are, I mean, you've been, you've been at this for a long time, decades, we can say. Uh, we 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 gotta know we gotta know a little bit more about Monty Moore before we get into Loco Hero. So I gotta know. I mean, uh, as a kid, were you always a comic book fan? Is this something a medium that you've always been a part of? Um. So I was as much or more of a gaming geek as I was comic books. I played a lot of Dungeons and Dragons as a kid. So I was the kid with the overactive imagination. And I decided to become an artist when I was 16. So I went and I got a degree in art. I paid for my own education. Um, But uh, I met uh, two brothers, uh, Gabe and Chachi Hernandez, in college. And they were doing their own comics project. Uh, and we self-published a comic. It was supposed to be called Lords of Light, but we had to change the name because there was a novel with a similar name. So it came out a single issue called Lords. We even did a, a signing back a mile high back in the day. Um, and uh, so that was 1993, and, I, and we went to our first San Diego Comic-Con to uh, promote it, and I was the colorist. And I airbrushed the entire comic book by hand. Because there was no digital, there was no, no nothing digital then. Um, so of that title, it was the only one we ever produced. There was a lot of pitfalls for self-publishing. Um, uh, so it kind of gave us the bug, like we wanted to do this. But we thought, well, maybe we should try to do it for other people rather than ourselves and like get other people to pay us. And so we continued to sort of freelance, and I became more of a um, uh, cover artist in comics. And so 1996, I think, was when I did my first freelance cover for a lesser-known bad girl title called Helena. I did a couple covers for them. And then that grew eventually into um, more well-known characters like Vampirella. Uh, Lady Death didn't come until, like, 2014. But for about 10 years, I primarily worked in the gaming field. So I worked on uh, Dungeons & Dragons, Harry Potter, Magic the Gathering, Lord of the Rings. Uh, so a lot of uh, TCG and CCG, which are collectible and tradable card games. Uh, so I made a pretty good name for myself there. And uh, painted covers had kind of gone out of vogue because the co- digital coloring was the new hotness for a decade. And uh, so there wasn't a, a lot of work. I usually would do one to three covers a year. And I hadn't come up with my own idea for my own story yet. Uh, so that wasn't anything I was pursuing. Um, I did do one fully painted project when I was just out of college, and I wanted Heavy Metal to publish it. Mm-hmm. And it was a sci-fi uh, vampire story uh, called Bloodlines. And uh, my best friend in college, Steve Oatney, he wrote it. And um, uh, it took me probably a year to illustrate it, just in the evenings. And but I did they heavy metal passed on it, so it sat for for I think seven to ten years, and then eventually I was doing some covers for Kolchak, the Night Stalker, for uh, Moonstone Publishing. I'm not sure if Moonstone is still around or not. Um, uh, they had uh, titles like the Phantom and uh, Kolchak and a lot of supernatural stuff. So anyway, I pitched the idea to them. I said, I've got this entire comic book. I just love to see it published. You know, if it makes some money, we'll share it. If it doesn't, at least it got published. And so they published Bloodlines, and that's the only full full color. I illustrated every single page. I even cut out the word balloons by hand and put them into every page, like old school. And um, uh, so that there's copies of that running around out there on eBay called Bloodlines. Mm-hmm. And um, and then it was later reproduced in one of my art books. So my my path to comics, they've always been a part of my professional career and as a kid we always had comics but um my family was uh is is a ranching family agriculture 
pretty conservative. And so, you know, comic books, they didn't really want us to have a lot of the action, you know, X-Men, what my mom maybe thought was kind of violent. So we had comics that were archy and, you know, things that were still fun and illustrated, um, but they're maybe what she deemed a little more safe. So uh, my friends and I would all trade comics and game stuff at school. So we almost always had, you know, Avengers, X-Men, DC. I was always a big Superman, Batman, Green Lantern uh, fan, but we, we read pretty much any comic that we could get our hands on that was Thor. And you might catch part of, uh, you know, one story. Like I remember one of my favorite stories was um, the Dark Phoenix saga where it was kind of a what if Phoenix hadn't died. And, you know, she pretty much ends up exploding the planet. And um, uh, so, you know, those things leave a mark on you. And then about the time I was coming out of college, I was going to the comic book store pretty regularly to get my fill of, visual art and I would see art from Olivia and Hajime Soriyama, uh, Louis Royo, uh, Joe Jessica, all these great illustrators. But um, Alex Ross was just coming onto the scene with Kingdom Come and then later Marvels that were these fully illustrated, just whole nother level in my book for fully painted illustrated projects. And so um, that really, you know, it kind of makes you want to be a part of it because you're thinking, wow, you know, as an illustrator, which is what I wanted to be, it's being an illustrator is cool, but being able to illustrate comics and games and sci-fi and fantasy is like the top. And I was a big Star Wars kid growing up. I, I even custom painted one of my motorcycles once with a Star Wars paint job. So, uh, you know, at heart, I'm a I'm a big time nerd when it comes to Dungeons and Dragons, Lord of the Rings. I read all the books. Sort of Shannara, all that kind of thing. And then in the last sort of five or ten years, comics have become even more of my home than the gaming has. And gaming has kind of been taken over by a lot of purely digital art. And there seems to be somewhat a less of a call for the traditional illustrators like myself who are still drawing and painting most of our projects. Yeah, um, that's... Uh... <laughs> That, that's actually a question I had for you down the road was uh, traditional or um, digital. And, it, I mean, that answers that, being traditional. And, unfortunately, it sounds like it's kind of uh, been a speed bump sticking to tradi- tra- too traditional. I mean, is that is that an, something easy to overcome or you just you veer around it and say, okay, well, I'm, just, I'm cool with just, you know, staying away from all that then? No, you know, I did, uh, I did like 10 paintings for Sony for one of their games called – uh, uh, Legends of Norath, which was like the second ever quest. And I shouldn't call them paintings because I have a real problem with calling, you know, things that are digital. I call it digital. That's just the description for it. So it's they're not paintings. They were just digital images. And, you know, I, I just don't enjoy sitting in front of a, a, the computer or the tablet, you know, all day long drawing on a screen. I love taking a blank piece of paper and turning it into a Lady Death painting or uh, something else. And so, uh, I have the skills to be able to do it. And I have all of the, um, technology. I have a Wacom tablet right next to me here. And so I'll end up using that primarily for, uh, uh, layouts and compositions, digital editing. If I need to do a fix on something that's my own art for a, a licensing thing, Oh, we like this, but can you move this over? Can you put a tree in the background? You want to be able to do that and not be a total Luddite and somebody who you know can't use technology. Uh, but um, I make a much better living as a traditional artist, I feel, because I sell a lot of original art. And I also want to have those traditional skills that when I go to a convention and a fan comes to me and says, will you draw Lady Death, She-Hulk, Iron Man, whatever, I have the confidence and the skills to be able to put that down on paper. And uh, uh, even during the pandemic, I've sold a number of originals to collectors, and uh, I would be missing out on that as part of my income. So uh, I try to realize what's best for each job. And the reason why I hired uh, Donnie for Pencils and Inks on Loco Hero and Sean Callahan, uh, a mutual friend of ours uh, here in Colorado, for Digital Colors is 
I want my book to be modern and appeal to the fans who are reading, you know, the the other comics that are out there today. So rather than saying, oh, well, I, I myself don't want to digitally color the whole thing, I'm going to find somebody who has the skill set to bring the book to life, do a beautiful job. And in a way, I'm also helping the art community because rather than me drawing and painting all my own book, I might do a cover over here for this publisher. And then I'm taking that money and I'm hiring four other artists. And that money is staying in the community. So since 2014, I've been self-funding Local Hero out of my own pocket, not rushing the project or anything. It's been six years. And I could pay Donnie and Sean, uh, my letterers, they're over in, in England, uh, Christopher and Jamie, uh, pay the, the uh, artists who I've had do variant covers, even buy some of the original art from them, put some more money in their pocket, gives me cool stuff for my Kickstarter. And then I'm able to use my sort of status, I guess, if you will, in the, in the community to help get their artwork out there. So there's people who are buying Donnie and, and, and other artists that I've hired, and I'm able to actually help them as well. And that makes me feel good as a writer creator, even though I'm not doing what I call the heavy lifting on the comics. I didn't illustrate the 48 pages. I'm doing covers and I'm writing and creating and I'm managing the project. Uh, but I'm not drawing all the interiors, which would take me years and years mm -hmm. because as an illustrator, my style is different than a sequential art storyteller, a visual storyteller. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, I know that when Sean said that he was uh, coloring a book for you, I thought, I, I mean, how long has he been working on this? Because he didn't tell me that yeah, you were writing it, not drawing it. Um, he just said, I'm working on a book for Monty. And so I thought, man, how long could a Monty illustrated book take? <laughs> like, when are we going to get this? <laughs> and um, I think the last time I saw Sean face to face, he's like, eh, I think I got the last page. And I'm like, all right, cool. Uh, this is maybe not that long after all. And then I realized, oh, there's another artist involved. So that makes sense. And I love how you, how, um, how you, uh, uh, manage this project the way you you dictate the time and all of that i'm a i'm a big fan of time management and for you to actually fund this yourself and do it in the way you do to keep the money in the community that that's amazing uh that that's that's brilliant is what that is um so th it brings me to my next for a while when i came up with the idea it was it's for the initial idea was for an ongoing tv series right a netflix series okay. or something like that and i thought i need to leverage um, my connections in the community and do a comic first because the last 15, 20 years, the most popular thing in all of Hollywood is what we, you know, comics to film. It doesn't matter whether it's Walking Dead, uh, all of Marvel's films, so many films out there, people have no idea of comics from The Road to Perdition to Men in Black, uh, mm -hmm. Kick Ass. People are like, really? Those were comics? I'm like, all of them. You have no idea. And uh, so I knew I needed to leverage that, but I kept thinking, am I going to draw this? Is somebody else going to draw this? Because it's not my strong point. I'm a cover artist. And I'd rather, if I have 25 hours to go into a piece of art, would I rather do one painting in 25 hours? Or would I try to do five pages and only get to spend five hours each on it? Right. Yeah. Right. So I decided as, a, as somebody who's been in the industry almost 30 years, like, hey, be smart about this. Go hire somebody who's, you know, uh, good and affordable on an indie creator budget uh, that, is, you know, is willing to do this. And, and I looked at a number of different artists first, and uh, I like the fact that the project is kind of international. Like Donnie's from mm -hmm. Indonesia. Sean and I are from Colorado. My, uh, my letterers are from England. You know, we have this kind of just worldwide community thing happening. I, I love it, uh, and that actually it, it brings me down to uh, my my next question: Is you are the great uh, Monty Moore? I mean, you 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 are you are the artist's artist. How do you f uh, filter out who's going to draw your story? I mean, because you, I, I would imagine you're looking for the perfection and nothing less, being who you are. I mean, how, how, what is that filtration process like? I, I think because of the fact that I consider myself a realist and not a perfectionist. It's actually a lot better for a project like this. Okay. And so, you know, have I seen and met hundreds and hundreds of artists in the, 
you know, 30 years I've been in the business? Absolutely. And actually, I even had a different artist um, uh, on the project in the beginning. Uh, his name was Leo Gondim, and he was doing a fantastic job. And he ran into some very serious personal issues with his family, and he needed to take care of that and step away from the project. And so um, later on, I actually had him working on another project of mine, which is a supernatural Western, a Western with vampires that's called Blood and Bullets. And so I said, well, why don't you, when you have time, why don't you work on this instead? Step away from Loco Hero, and I'll find somebody else for Loco Hero. And so um, uh, because I, I use social media quite a bit, so it's a visual medium, you get to see a lot of things people post. And I'm a member of a lot of Facebook groups that are comics groups, like the Collector's Corner. And, you know, just that group alone has got 17,000 members. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of them are fans, but a lot of them are, are amateur artists or just beginning in their career. And so when you see a piece of art or something stands out, you go, whoa, this artist's got some chops. You know, and then maybe you go to their page and, you know, they might not be available or they might not be affordable or they – Maybe you're great at, at pinups, but they they wouldn't have the time management to do an entire comic book, let alone a 48-page comic book, right? It's twice the size of a normal one. And so um, uh, when I found uh, Donnie, and I don't know if I pronounced his last name right. I think it's Hadawa. Um, and uh, I asked him to do a, a, a test piece for me, which actually is one of the variant covers in the Kickstarter that Sean also colored. And so his very first drawing ever was so good. I'm using it as a cover, and I was like, "Oh, this is killer! You're hired. Let's let's do this." And but because this was years ago, this is at least three or four years ago, I think. Um, uh, I didn't push very hard, and and actually, for I would say the the long waits in between when there was stuff happening was because of me, and it would be because I was so busy in the summers with conventions that they might send me, Donnie might send me layouts, and he's got an editor on his end as well, named Andre, and they might send me something, and then two weeks later, I go, hey, have you had a chance to review the you know layouts we say? And I'm like, oh my God, it's crazy, and I've got San Diego Comic-Con this week, and I, I promise I'll get back to you later. And then you know I have two weeks of recovery from San Diego, and suddenly you know maybe a month has gone by. And so I was like, yeah, I apologize. Let me get on this so you can move forward, and I can get you paid. And uh, so if anything, managing it on top of me being an artist, somebody who's on the road and working in both fine art and comics, um, I, didn't, I didn't drive everybody to be like, oh, my God, I need this on Tuesday, which is most of what our industry is, myself included. Uh, I have lots of deadlines looming all the time, like every week. <laughs> Oh, I can imagine. I mean, uh, you're 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 all over the place. I mean, are you still painting motorcycles and drawing Magic the Gathering stuff? I mean, uh, well, I, I, I scaled back on some of it. Uh, I only did one custom vehicle project last year, and it was a big okay. one. It was a, a whole truck, so it involved a giant four and a half foot mural on the front of the truck, and it was depicting the owner of the vehicle uh, as a female warlock. And there was all these like personal, uh, you know, talismans and things in the art. And then there was a, a, a mural on the tailgate. So I do keep the Maverick custom paint website up uh, so people can see the nearly probably 100 to 200 vehicles that I painted. Um, but I don't really go and do the shows anymore. Um, right. That was kind of a season that I enjoyed when I did it. And I kind of, you know, I, I consider myself semi-retired from the vehicles because I'm enjoying comics so much. Uh, the projects that I get to do, the conventions, um, it just feels a better place for me uh, to be. And um, uh, But in addition, the last three or four years, even though I'm not doing vehicles, I have kind of ramped up fine art totally outside of the pop culture art. So... I have done a number of fine art shows. Uh, I have some art in some galleries. So um, much like a few other artists out there, like Julie Bell shows her artwork in a number of fine art galleries that's Western and wildlife. There's, there's a perceived ceiling of what somebody might pay for pop culture art and dragons and things like that. Whereas for some reason, if you were to take that same level and you paint a, a bison or a beautiful wolf or a hawk, 
the fine art collectors, you know, the sky is kind of the limit. And so you, you will find that there's a lot of illustrators that when you look back in history from Norman Rockwell to Frank McCarthy, uh, some of these Western guys whose pieces now go in the hundreds of thousands uh, towards the end of their career, a lot of them started out as illustrators. And then if they kind of get tired for working for commercial clients, they usually gravitate towards fine art. And the fine art means they paint what they want to and they don't let anybody dictate that. I love it. Yeah, I know there's a few artists out there that I follow. I know Jason Sean Alexander is one of them. He's, he does Spawn, but then he goes and sells six-figure paintings, uh, you know, off to the side in between panels. I mean, it's yeah, I, I, man, you're you're all over the place, dude. You're you. I mean, you really are. Uh, as far as you know, the the well, oh man, here comes the pun: the Ru- Mount Rushmore of artists. <laughs> uh, I mean, <laughs> I like that. It just came to me. Um, yeah, no, it's a. Uh, so it's it's awesome that you of all the people that you could strive to bring into this hero loco you bring in uh, relevant uh, unknowns for the most part so and that's 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 big of you because you could easily i mean you have the the really just the name to bring in anybody you want i'm monty moore come do this book for me and i'm sure there's 90 percent of illustrators out there be like okay yeah sure but you you, you, you're bringing in these, these you know, the Sean Callahans. And I, I got to say, I mean, I, I, as soon as I saw the, the, the Kickstarter uh, photos up there, I was like, that is Sean Callahan. That is. I know those colors, man. I've got, I've got his portfolio sitting behind me. I'm such a huge fan of his work. So I know that I'm, I'm going to be blown away by this. I am. He so- did a, a great job, and, and I didn't dictate anything to any of the, the artists, you know, from – Donnie doing his layouts to Sean with colors that unless there was something specific, like once the costume of the character, like this is what it's going to look like color wise. uh, It was basically complete freedom. And uh, I would say uh, there was probably less than maybe three to five changes total in an entire 48 page book. If I said, Hey, you know, could, how about we adjust this? over here and normally you know sean would send me something and i would click through the you know we'd do like five pages at a time and i'd click there and be like oh my god this looks amazing here you go here's you know here and that that way everybody gets paid piecemeal as you go and it's not like oh my god you have to finish a whole book before you get paid i mean that's no way for people to you know get a paycheck and so we do chunks of five and um i you know i like helping artists that when i was in their position and I was going to be a colorist, you know, as I told mentioned earlier, um, when I started out and I airbrushed uh, our Lords of Light book, uh, a friend of mine who used to work very closely with Todd McFarlane, uh, her name is Clydeen Nee, uh, her brother John Nee is one of the heads of, of DC, and uh, she had her own coloring studio, and they did the initial colors on Spawn. And I had a, a uh, there was a, a book that was a four-issue miniseries done by another Coloradan here in town named Parker Smart. Uh, and his book was called CC. And I was going to color the whole thing. And I had some conversations with Clydeen and she said, I, I think you should keep doing what you're doing. I see what you're doing with paints and traditional art. And I was going to have to learn digital coloring. And she said, here's my suggestion. Keep doing what you're doing. The, you know, There will be other people for that, but I think you have a knack for you know, doing traditional and fantasy and painting. And I said, okay, I'm going to take your advice. And so in hiring Sean and Donnie and any of the other folks that are on the project, I like the fact that I can remember being that artist just starting out and going, oh my God, this is my first bigger project or this is something that it's going to make me money for a couple of months or a couple of years or whatever. And, um, you know, I, I paid the artists what they were asking. I didn't say, hey, I'm Monty Moore and this is high exposure uh, and uh, will you cut your rate in half? I basically said, hey, uh, I, I like what I see you're doing. Would you like to do a test page? And if so, and it works out and I want to hire you, what's your rate? And they say, this is my rate over here. And I go, wow, this is really great for what I'm getting. I'm happy to pay your rate and, and let's move forward. And uh, I awesome. never had to wait for Sean. And he's actually had, you know, a new... Uh, babies and first it was a wedding mm-hmm. and you know things like that so there's a few things here and there but it, it's not like the uh uh there was a looming 
deadline that had to be met. So if he said, hey, sorry, I haven't got anything for two weeks, I'm like, don't worry about it. (laughs) (laughs) That's awesome, man. That's awesome. I know he's a great guy, and he's going to get the work done. I've I've worked with him. I know he's going to get the work done. Um, so let's, let's talk about the, let's talk about Loco Hero, man. Let's talk about the big project, the big Kickstarter that's, well, I, 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 I got to start out by saying you had a $2,500 goal and the last I looked, it's surpassed 25,000 right now. Um, it it might've, while we were online, I think it was at 23 or 24 and some change, um, earlier today, but there might've been some bids. No, there's been some bits. Uh, just a few minutes ago, it was over 25K. Okay, so that's pretty awesome. So <laughs> I'm going to do a debut later today, and I'm going to reveal the Eric Basildura cover, Ebass, uh, who turned in a cover to me last night. Uh, and uh, I told people that when, they, when we hit 25K, that I would drop that as a new reward. And uh, I can make an announcement here that I have not told e- anybody, even on Facebook, that this is going to be the first ever collaboration, and I'm actually going to do a painted version of his cover. So it will be uh, an e-bass and more, more e-bass, and um, uh, I will do the painted version of it, and it will be a cover in the campaign. And so that will be the the big news that drops, that you heard it here first on Cheers to Comics, that um, for probably about 10 years since we first met, and I got a notification that today, 10-year Today, this day, actual, not yesterday, is our 10-year anniversary on Facebook. So I met Eric at, uh, I want to say, Emerald City Con and, you know, sent him a friend request. So today is the 10-year anniversary, and today is going to be the announcement that we're doing our first ever collaboration, uh, that he's doing a cover for my book. I'm going to be doing some art for his book, Mojo, and um, we're we're doing some trade there, and then I'm going to do a fully painted version of uh for of his cover for local hero that's oh man that's exciting i man that's that's great i love an exclusive i love an exclusive <laughs> oh this is so awesome you brought up the 25k because i was like well that's when i'm gonna you know drop the 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 news because uh, i woke up this morning and came in checked my computer and here i had new art and eric is moving this week into uh, buying a new house and he's like oh my god it's crazy I'm, I'm moving I'm getting a house sorry I'm late and I said you know when you get it to me you get it to me but just so you know the Kickstarter is rolling like last Saturday you know we said drop this thing in the pipe so I had to reach out to Mike DeBalfo Jamie Tyndall and Ebass and say I'm moving forward I'm not lighting a fire under your butt you can be a part of the campaign or it can be a post campaign reward and uh, they're all working away that's awesome, man. That's awesome. Well, psh, well deserved. Well deserved. Ah, man, I can't wait to see it. I can't wait to see it. That's big news. That's that's great. I'm jazzed. Like I want to start on it now. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. Um, so uh, I I have to I I have to ask Loco Hero. I mean, it's been an idea in the works for a while. Where does this come from? Tell us tell us about this book, man. Okay. Um, it kind of an interesting, very comic story about the idea that came to me. I was at San Diego Comic Con in 2014, and I had had a couple of meetings earlier in the day with a friend of mine who's a film producer. We had already worked on two films together, uh, one that I wrote and produced and one that he wrote and produced. And um, I was walking back uh, to my car. you got to go downstairs at the at, uh, convention center. But I was up in front of the convention center at night, and the costume contest was going on that night. And so walking towards me is a group of cosplayers. You see it you know, all day long at convention. Four or five folks dressed up as superheroes. But at the same time that they're walking one way, a woman passes me going the same direction I am. And um, she was clearly homeless. She's pushing her cart with belongings. Uh, and uh, obviously she was struggling with mental illness because she was having a very loud, very aggressive argument with herself, and there was nobody else there, and I was like, oh, wow, this is crazy. And then I thought, oh, well, wait a minute. What if I was to do a project that could be a film or a comic, and my superhero is a woman who's homeless, and she's crazy, we call it crazy, but, you know, mental illness, but she thinks she's a superhero, doesn't actually okay. have powers. 
And so, you know, at the same time, I'm sort of passed by superheroes going one direction. Visually, they look like superheroes. But this woman here is struggling with her own reality. And so what if these people who have a different reality of their world, I want to be a superhero, right? They're dressed up. So she dresses up and her realities cross over. And here you have somebody who has no power. She lives in our real world, but she thinks she's a superhero. And when her um, dissociative disorder kicks in, like when she goes into fight or flight mode, she goes into uh, thinking she's a superhero and her reality changes. She envisions herself, even if she's dressed in her superhero stuff, she might think that the three bad guys that she sees that are beating up somebody, a you know, homeless person or mugging somebody, she might actually think that they look like ninjas. And if she okay. thinks they look like a ninja, well, then she must be a samurai or a daimyo or a ronin. So in the comic book, the reality changes and the entire scene, even though she's not physically going anywhere, it's not time travel. It just appears suddenly like she's a samurai and they're ninjas and they need to be dealt with because they're bad guys. And in her brain, bad guys must look like a black knight or a mutant on a motorcycle, Mad Max or aliens or, you know, whatever. And so you end up with this visual opportunity to have your character in the settings be unlimited whatever the artist imagines and so a lot of the variant covers the three or four variant covers that have been revealed so far really reveal different settings one has her looking in the mirror and it's her looking back as a superhero the marat michaels is split right down the middle and it's her in her superhero costume on one side facing a thug but on the other side she looks like a roman gladiator facing off against an undead guy with a spear and a hawk mask because that's maybe how her cross wiring makes it appear. And uh, so it's a great opportunity for a grounded humanistic story because she does live on the street. She's homeless. So much like Bruce Wayne, who is a vigilante and a crime fighter, but he has everything that money can buy. Take all that money and the house and the support and Alfred and surveillance. Take all that away. And you have a person who has nothing but courage and the skills to do it. So part of the backstory of her is is that she grew up uh, uh, with from an immigrant father, but with a love of our country. So that's the reason why she goes into the military later. And she has army skills. But she trained as a martial artist in the martial arts her whole childhood because I wanted her to be physically capable. So had had she been a man in the army, she would have been your special forces Green Beret, uh, kind of, uh, you know, uh, soldier. Uh, so she is in combat, but her there there's some flashbacks that deal with some of the things that happened to her in Afghanistan. So when she comes back to the States, unfortunately, like a lot of our vets, she ends up dealing with survivor's guilt uh, and PTSD and lives on the streets. And so um, uh, my I'm a very patriotic person. I have a lot of military fam, uh, family from current day all the way back to George Washington's armies. We had uh, oh. ancestors who crossed the Delaware with George Washington. And I have a certificate on my wall that is a copy that was signed by George Washington that one of my family members still owns. And so I, I, when all of this came together for Loco Hero, I thought, wow, this is an opportunity for me to tell a cool story, to bring to light something that's personal for me that would help our veterans and also uh, shine a light on the look, you know, what people might call the lower part of our civilization. People who live on the streets who maybe need a hand up instead of a hand out. And so here you have a character who is uh, pretty much the whole story takes place in the slums other than the sort of corporate bad guy who wants to eradicate that section so he can redevelop it for um, uh, for retail. And in her crossed wiring, when she reads the story about this guy who's a developer who's doing this, she thinks he's building a super villain headquarters. Oh, okay. okay. And, and, the, and she's the only person that can stop him. So the only way she can stop him is if she dresses up as a superhero and she stops this sort of 
thugs, this street crew that he's got that are trying to push out all the homeless from the area. And because we're from Denver, when I'm writing and thinking all of this, I think of where the Denver mission is downtown and uh, Brighton yeah. Boulevard, right when it comes across and goes underneath the bridge and, and our family's business used to be up there. And so I would drive through that area all the time. So I picture that mission and that shelter and those people living in the park and under bridges and things like that, um, because that's where I decided to set my story. And I don't know of another superhero story that's set in the, you know, in Skid Row or meth, you know, meth row kind of a thing. Yeah, not not so much. Usually, I mean, it's just the entire town is shit, like Gotham City or Hell's Kitchen or something like that. It's usually the whole, not not just a, a specific couple of alleys, you know. Right. Like, yeah, this is more like most of the story, at least in the beginning, you know, it's probably taking place in five or ten blocks or something. Right. Yeah, well, um, and I guess I have the advantage of being in the, the, the area that's inspiring you. Um, now I'm gonna, when I go into this, I'm going to have that much more of a visual to play off of because I've walked through those areas, man. I know where there's Tent City and all that crap now. and I mean, it's it's rough down there. And uh, to, to have that type of visual going into this, it it's, it's going to make it that much more for, for me. I guess I have that advantage, but uh, I'm sure every other reader out there is... Uh, uh, there's there's more to this than just saying this is a the hero story. I think there's actually a message to be had out of this as far as, you know, the, the homeless situation. I think it's so much more than just Monty saying, hey, this, this homeless girl is more capable than she seems. Um, I, I mean, uh, what what is the... Uh, I mean... The, the the homeless situation beyond just that one interaction that you had with that 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 woman i mean do you have any other uh i guess relationships that i mean a, a close partner anything like that that you've seen that you've had to witness go through all that that was going to further drive this story um not as much on the the homeless side uh i don't know you've probably didn't been down on broadway but um mm. Uh, I like to support the VFW post number one, which is down on Broadway, and that's the very first post that was ever created for the veterans of foreign wars. And uh, again, that goes back to, you know, my grandfather was an admiral in the Navy. So even though he retired and had a very distinguished career and commanded an aircraft carrier and things like that, um, you know, many others in my family who had served, uh, you know, weren't necessarily officers and had that kind of thing, but I feel a connection to the the military and the vets, and so uh, every year I go t- to the um, uh, the banquet that they hold that supports the the VFW post number one. And there's a number of comic book artists, uh, 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 a couple of guys, I don't know, Zach Conley, Zach Hennessy, who have volunteered some of their time down there as well, to, and they teach art at the Veterans uh, of Foreign Wars at VF Post 1. And uh, I've donated some of my old printers, uh, volunteer to do airbrush demos and things like that. And so they, at that particular center, which is kind of what uh, how I'm connected to it locally, uh, they, they do art shows and art galleries, and you can buy art from the vets, as well as some of the guest artists like me who might come in and volunteer or, or give them items that helps them. So they use art as therapy down there. And uh, a lot of their outreach uh, goes to, you know, vets who don't necessarily have a home. So through my sort of, I guess, sort of connection or kind of portal through that, other than trying to be generous when I can to when I see people who are struggling, is I try to do use my art and resources through the VFW to reach the vets who are struggling. And a lot of times when they do say their Thanksgiving day uh, food drive uh, where people, you make food, you take it down there, they're feeding an extra hundred, 200 people on Thanksgiving uh, through the VFW. And so um, usually my connections are kind of through them because I can reach out to them anytime I want. And then what I decided to do once the Kickstarter, the day it was going live, we reached out to an organization called operation second chance and they actually work with the, the vets in Washington, D.C., who are coming out of Walter Reed Hospital, which is a military hospital. And so veterans who are struggling with both emotional, mental, and physical issues and are trying to get go into civilian life, a lot of times there's a lot of hard transition. 
And if they don't have a support system there or a family or if they feel disconnected, then that's there's a much greater chance that they're going to end up on the streets and homeless. And so I decided that one of the covers that I drew, uh, I know our viewers can't see it, but I know I have the original art here. So anybody who watches the replay video, uh, I don't know if we can actually see this art that I'm holding up. Well, we saw it for a second, but that that green screen is, uh, oh, I don't know what happened. Oh, uh, well, I don't know. Anyway, <laughs> you can, on the Kickstarter, if you go to Honor Bound, yes. uh, you'll be able to see this cover being offered. And it has, I, I've, la- I've done some digital work where I've laid over um, kind of an American flag over her. And then I put the pages that Donnie and Sean did of her struggles in the background on the cover. So you know it's a comic book. And I'm donating all of the proceeds from that particular cover, which is now our best-selling cover. That's the most pledged item. And um, so any of the money that's raised from that cover is going to go directly to Operation Second Chance. And not just through the Kickstarter. So I have made this cover unlimited so that it can generate money for years to come. And so anytime I sell one of those, I just keep a running tally. And, you know, maybe every month or so I'll say, hey, you know, I sold these books. Here you go. Here's a check. And they that goes directly to um, the Operation Second Chance. That's amazing. That That is absolutely incredible of you. Uh, it's, you're not, I, I like that you don't just use the, the, the medium as a tool to tell a story. You actually go back and give back to the thing that is giving you the opportunity to tell these stories. And that's, that's admirable because there's so many people out there that say, hey, you know, we got to support these guys and read this story. But then that's, that's it. You're, you're making sure that this, this book can continue to give back to really the inspiration behind it all. So that, that, I, I admire that. That's awesome. Monty. Yeah, I guess when I was, you know, when I kind of came up with that and then the idea hit me, I thought, well, you know, I could continue to some of the funds from this book could go just, you know, to the VFW in Denver and I'll probably do that. Or we'll come out with some other covers like this that are maybe other specific for fundraising. But, you know, the comics community has been very good to me and it continues to do so. And so it just when I had the idea, I thought I got to do this because I don't want to just come out with it and be like, geez, you know, Monty's being pretty successful and, uh, you know, with this art project and things like that. But where's the philanthropy part of it? And other than, you know, just donating funds and things like that, I like the fact that the art itself is also part of the message. So when people say, I want to get this book and cover and read it or I'm going to collect it or I'm going to buy two. Right. So it's an extra donation. And then we're going to probably try to reach out to um, some philanthropy. We might even reach out to Mile High Comics and say, hey, would you like to buy some books and or just make a donation towards that? And we'll give you these books uh, in, uh, you know, as part of that as well. Um, well, if you know Chuck at all, you know that his, uh, his, his connection to the homeless in Denver is about as close as it gets. Next to Mile High Comics is feeding Denver's hungry. So we've got that, that where we've got the world's largest comic book warehouse, and then next to that is the warehouse for feeding Denver's hungry. Chuck's very involved with that. I could guarantee that Chuck would be all over this, man. Mile High's all about this. Yeah, yeah. So Josh and I were talking about that last week, and I've been so focused on the project, I had kind of forgotten about that because, you, you know, you get blinders on for what you're doing. And then you kind of think, oh, my gosh, yeah, right here in the background, you know, the back of this, we have Chuck and all the great works that he does. And uh, as a total side story, two or three years ago when I did my last Kickstarter, I was producing a 25-year retrospective. And the very last minute, right before I went to print, the printer said, we can't print this because your book has a little bit of nudity in it. And they print, they also print um, yearbooks for high schools. And apparently they have uh, tours that come through and high school kids. And I said, wait a minute, you guys came to me and said, can we print your book? You recruited me for you to print it. And now you're saying you won't print it. And I posted something on Facebook about, Hey, sorry, this is going to be delayed. I've got to go find a new printer. And let me tell you the next day there was an email that I was copied on and it was from Chuck and without even asking him for help, he basically said, we're going to bring the, you know, CBDLF down on your ass for censorship. 
and Monty is a solid contributor to our community and all this kind of thing, and you're going to hose him, and I will make sure that no comics publisher ever uses your services. And let me tell you, due to that email, not only did they help me find another printer, they had to write a check for $7,000 to the other printer to pay for the difference because mm-hmm. the other printer's bid was higher. And that was all thanks to Chuck. So, Chuck's the man. Yeah. That man so, makes moves. Uh, he, he's always been a very good, uh, a strong advocate for censorship, community, and homeless and stuff. So uh, I think there'll probably be some sort of partnership or maybe we'll do another exclusive cover just for Mile High. And then we'll donate all of that, those funds, to the homeless. There you, there you go. go. I think that, we just had an idea that was born here on the show. <laughs> this is, I love it. I'm going to make that it. happen with Chuck. Uh, get a hold of him. The nice part is is that outreach would go to uh, – we can have one going to the vets and things like that before maybe they're running into their, you know, some problems with transition. And then we could also affect some change here locally with Denver – Obviously, especially in our community, that winters are very hard. It's not like being in San Diego or Florida or something like that. Um, and it's not like we have enough shelters where they can all go and all be fed and there's nobody on the streets. There are plenty of people who still struggle. Oh, yes. And there's still snow on the ground in some places in Denver. I mean, the, the, the weather doesn't ever really ever let up. I rode my um, motorcycle and, yesterday, and I was actually up in the high country, and there was snow. It snowed on us, and I was like, this is a little colder than I expected. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, man, this is this is incredible. I'm loving this. Uh, so, I mean, you're you're normally an artist, as we all know. Um, so what is that transition to, to creating and writing your own comic? I mean, what what is that? I mean, how difficult of a process is that? Obviously, I mean, uh, not all the listeners know, but you do have a background in writing. You've done screenplays, so this isn't the first thing you've ever written. I mean, you did, I'm um, sorry, bl- Blood Born? Blood, Blood and Bullets is, is one Blood of the Bull- projects that was a... Oh, okay. A screenplay that's been optioned about four times. Uh, I started out, I wrote a horror script uh, that was immediately optioned and put into production, but the guy who tried to produce it totally dropped the ball, ran out of money. It was a real disaster. But um, again, kind of like comics, it gave me the bug to do it. And if for some reason I couldn't draw anymore and I couldn't do something like make music, I'm sure I would write stories or I would dictate or something. Um, because I love telling stories. And so I started back in 08, I wrote my first screenplay. And I, you know, I read a couple of books, bought some software, and just jumped into it. And I think it felt natural to me as a, um, just as a creator to, you know, uh, write an entire 100 page story. And so the initial version of Loco Hero. First, I wrote down all the notes. You develop your characters. And then right before I was going to start the, um, the the screenplay for a feature film, I changed it. I had to read a few things on how to format for television writing, and I wrote it as a pilot episode. And so what the pilot episode goes through trans- is what became the graphic novel. So I didn't have to, I didn't have to crack the um, sort of 64-page pilot episode in half i basically just truncated and i said okay well not every page is a page in the comic and which is fine because sometimes when people are just talking you don't want it to be an entire page so i would just go through and i would look and i'd print out the the screenplay and i gave it to donnie and i would say that page 15 goes from here to here and it might be one page it might be two and a half or three pages so i said you got to tell all of that in that piece of and I've got to be able to get it all on there. So that's how I broke it up. And then I would, have, I would have to write a lettering script to give to the letterers because that's very specific because it has mm-hmm. narration and call-outs and sound effects and all that. So then I would have to go back and, and rewrite essentially everything so that it was formatted into a comic book lettering script because they said, hey, we'll letter this for you, but you can't just give us the screenplay. <laughs> I was like, oh, crap. You know, so again, it was a learning experience for me because I didn't know that comics had a lettering script. 
That's awesome. No, these are all these are great things for. I mean, because I know that a lot of the people that listen to this show they're they're aspiring creators themselves. So to hear it, to hear the uh, the process that Monty went through for the first time and the, the the learning curve and all that. This is this is very insightful stuff. This is awesome. You started out just submitting it as a screenplay, and then the, <laughs> it's the artists and the the other people saying, no, 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 Monty, <laughs> we need it like this. That that's that's pretty cool. Right. Well, so, so you know, I can feel more comfortable going into a second issue. Obviously, the Kickstarter is going well enough that you know it makes me already sort of reach out to the crew and say, hey, you know, you want to do this again? You know, what's your availability? Because things change, obviously. Um, if one of these guys had, you know, just gotten a contract for Marvel or DC or something, they might say, Hey, I had fun, but I'm doing the flash. And I'd be like, Hey, good for you. I get it. You know? And then I, you know, I'll go and support a different artist, but I'd rather keep the team together because they did a great job. And Sean and Donnie who did the interiors also have two covers of their own. And I kind of feel like that even though I'm a cover artist and I primarily get hired to do covers so it helped sell the books i also wanted them to be rewarded and get their scene their work seen on covers so i have two covers donnie and sean have two covers and then i have four variant artists currently and then a couple in the in the back we talked about ebass earlier so we're going to drop his cover today uh so that people can see that and uh that way everybody gets a share of uh the the limelight if you will too because you know comics it's about visibility. Yep. Yes, you're absolutely right. And I mean, it's, it's, I can't tell you how much I appreciate it, not even being a creator, just knowing that someone of your stature is willing to, to really extend the olive branch the way that you have. It's, this, is, this is awesome. Um, you kind of touched on this a second ago. I, my, one of my questions was, is how long of a series do you plan on going with this? Because I know this Kickstarter is for f- of the 48-page graphic novel. Um, it sounds like you do have ideas to carry this beyond. I mean, is this something that could lo- live as a you know a one shot forty eight page story, and with you know, and we'd be satisfied with, or is this something we want more? Yeah, want you, more? yeah, you probably wouldn't be satisfied with it because I've introduced who the bad guys were and and some of okay. the stuff their shady things that they're doing in the background. It's not just that he's a you know a tycoon, but you know he's using extortion and blackmail and gotcha. you know all sorts of stuff to get what he wants done. And so the original story arc that I had written that was for a feature film is actually not what ended up being the um, the pilot episode, right? So this kind of goes up into the point of the creation of the character, a little bit of her backstory of when she was in the military, not a lot. Okay. Um, and then the drama that sort of creates her and really just the very beginning of her going out. You only get to see one sort of prolonged fight scene of her in costume fighting. There's some other altercations that she's dressed and looks differently, like her street clothes or whatever, uh, before she sort of turns into a superhero. So this kind of covers that. And, you know, the super part of her is is that it's really just courage and how she looks. She doesn't actually have any powers. Uh, quite the opposite. She's she's hampered by, you know, her reality and things like that. But um, I, I I think it would take two or three uh, okay. graphic novels of this size to get through the first arc and tell what I might have put into a, a feature film, which would be, hey, is, has she managed to overcome her first obstacle or temporarily postpone the you know the dumps being the 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 slum area that she lives from being sort of bulldozed and turned into a shopping mall but there will always be other stories and or other setbacks and things like that that still can be told with the character because this first story arc is really just an introduction you know because yeah, like it sounds like you green yeah. arrow or something like that yeah, because it, it, it does sound like you, you laid out an unlimited amount of possibilities being that her imagination is the, the limit. So, I mean, yeah, I, I would definitely like to see this go more than 48. That, that's more than 48 pages. <laughs> I mean, I'm... Uh, so, uh, I, I have to ask, I mean, I'm sure you would have no problem getting any publisher to take you on. Why was it that you decided specifically to go with uh, Kickstarter and self-fund this? Was this uh, part of your... 
um, plan with uh, the time management and getting your artists on board, Sean, and all of that, or is this just something that said, you know, screw publishers? I want to make sure that this is mine and will always be mine. And I mean, what was the pro- thought process behind that? It's a little bit more of the second, I guess. So much, not so much. Uh, screw the publishers, because I certainly could approach some of the contacts that I have and probably get them to take a look. But it really comes back to the fact that. I, I'm personally connected to the story enough that I really would love to see it eventually on some sort of screen format. And it just comes down to maintaining a clear ownership and title to the rights. Uh, and now there are some publishers out there. I think uh, Image still lets people do, you know, create their own projects where they own a certain part of it. But um, seeing the success of uh, Coffin Comics, uh, Contraband Comics, Uh, So many of these self-publishers that say, we now can reach the fans directly, and you don't have to give up a lion's share of both rights and or profit, that it seems like this was just the right place to go. So the last couple of years, I've kind of been thinking more of, I think I would go that route. I guess I didn't think it would necessarily be quite as successful of a launch as we have had, especially during a time of what's going on in the, in the world. But um, we do have an audience that's in, more in front of their computers, more now at the moment than ever have been. And uh, a lot of the books that I'm, the, the story, if it's not a variant cover or one of the specialty items, these items will be available for years. So I'm not shutting somebody out who says, wow, I can't believe you launched this during a time when I have lost my job or I'm not working and maybe they can't support the Kickstarter, they'll be able to buy the Monty Moore honorbound cover that's the donating of the proceeds. They'll be able to get some of the regular covers, Sean Callahan uh, and Donnie have two. Those will be unlimited, you know, sort of first issues because of print on demand capabilities. So nobody's missing out on me sort of launching it during this time. It's just that there might be some specialty and incentive items and all the cool swag. Like we've already unlocked like, you know, six cool freebies and I'm going to drop another one today because we hit 25,000. And so I think maybe that's a metal chromium card or something. Uh, I'd have to look at the the stretch goals and um, there will be some things that are for our backers only. uh, And there will be some things that do run out and there'll be other things that everybody can get and share. That's that's awesome. I know, and I and that stuff. Uh, if they're not, if it's not accessible now, it it's a collector's market out there. I mean, uh, people, it's going to be circulating on eBay. I mean, it's still going to be accessible in the collector's market. I mean, people people know that it's it's not hard to make a dollar off of your name. <laughs> I mean, that's that's. I mean, they're going to try. They're going to try. Yeah, uh, two weeks ago we dropped a, a hardly thin uh, cover. It's a Harley Quinn parody. And that came out through Comics Elite, and he offered 100, 125 copies, and it sold out in 11 minutes. <laughs> and uh, uh, there was a couple of people on the live. We're still live. And somebody chimed in and said, oh, there's already one of these. Oh, like they, they were sure they got one. There's already one on eBay for double. And you're like, well, okay, we live in a capitalist society. So, you know, I, I, on the one hand, I'm sort of torn. I'm like, really? You need to turn around and make a buck on it. But it's a business. You know, and it's like, well, I guess it's somebody's willing to pay double for it. It's good for my reputation. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, that's that's. I think that just validates who you are. I mean, I think I, I would be pretty stoked if uh, I don't know if there was some weird lost tape of Cheers out there, and I saw it circulating on eBay or something like that. I'd be like, hey, these, <laughs> this is cool. This is cool. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> I don't know. I, I find that to be very. I, I don't think I could ever be mad at that. I'm like, all right, this is people. Respect the name, I guess. Um, when it comes to somebody, you know, reselling an original piece of art or a sketch, if it sells for three or four hundred or three or four times more what I charge them, that just means my career is going in the right direction. I don't want people to lose money on my art. They can do go. whatever they want with it. And so, if they, you know, if, if say somebody got a commission for me for years and years ago, and it was a hundred bucks. And now that same commission sells for 500. I expect them to sell that for 500, not 100. They invested in me at a time and they paid what I asked for it. So everybody wins. Yep. 
Yeah, I agree. <laughs> um, speaking of uh, merchandising and things floating around uh, in the collector's market, I know that you have a bit of a background with uh, statues and figures and things like that. Do you, uh, have you been laying out designs for any Loco Hero toys? I mean, are we going to get any of that? Is that going to be like a top tier Kickstarter project? We get fifty, you know, it hits fifty k, and we're going to. Good idea. I think. <laughs> I think I better start thinking about that. <laughs> I, I mean, and uh, NSC Live TV, they know how to recruit idea idea people and between kevin and i man we're we're gonna make sure local heroes <laughs> we're gonna make sure it's out there so we're gonna have mile high exclusive variants by the end of this <laughs> i said by the end of this podcast we're gonna have mile high exclusive variants and local hero action figures let's make this happen monty <laughs> yeah i think i would probably before i'd go action figure i'd probably go you know just statuette you know kind of collectible um i do have one of the sculptures that's in my sculpture collection from years ago that I did that was a post 9-11 figure. And she's actually all just in kind of grays and things like that. And the figure is very kind of witch blade-esque, but she's holding kind of a torn American flag. And so I call that piece Standing United. And it was based off of a piece that I painted within weeks of of that event happening. And so, you know, I could see something with Loco Hero that, somehow has a tie-in or or maybe it could be sculpted in a way that's half her figure facing one way, half the other, you know, the way she's dressed or something. It'd be really kind of neat. Like, Oh, this is, this is how she appears and this is how she thinks she looks. Oh, I, I I could see it now, man. Oh man. I, uh, let's make it happen. (laughs) Oh, I'm so excited. Uh, Monty, man, I, I don't know what your schedule is looking like, but I'm looking at my notes here and I realize I've got like another, hours worth of question <laughs> um I, I don't want to keep you on too long but uh, i i know a big part of this is uh you know when i bring on those creators it's obviously to promote whatever they're doing but also a big part of it is for any listeners to you know dive into your brains so i i, I like to ask a few i like to say they're just white bread questions but i think at the same time they're kind of I don't know, pivotal to uh, dissecting how a creator's brain works or what, wh- where their mind is in certain things. So I'm going to throw out just a few rapid-fire questions, and you don't have to put a whole lot of thought into these. It's more of a, a, a lightning round type of thing, if you will. But um, if anything, I prefer that you put as little thought into it as possible. Just to, uh, I, um, So uh, I, I, wh- who's your favorite character to draw? I know you get a lot of commissions asked for. Who's your favorite to draw? Uh, Lady Death, for sure. Yeah, right on. You get a ton of freedom with it too, because she doesn't have just like one outfit. So every time you get to draw her, it can be different. Yes, and man, uh, you've you've drawn her differently. We've all seen it. <laughs> um, uh, a favorite hero? Uh, I'm kind of believe it or not, I'm kind of a Superman guy, and okay. maybe for what he stood for, one of the longest standing ones. I've got a number of statues and things like that around here, and so. You know, I don't know, the the truth, justice, American way thing, that just always resonated with me. All right, I could see that. I'm being a, a man of the veterans and, you know, having a, a, a heart for the people. Yeah, I could see it being a Superman guy. Yeah, that makes I sense. have my, my, my shirt on. I don't know if you can see it. And I, 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 it says yeah, that uh, that's the, the real American hero. <laughs> yeah, I, I noticed that uh, about 40 minutes ago. I thought that, that shirt's amazing. <laughs> That's so awesome. Because, I mean, it's totally G.I. Joe if you don't look at it properly. I mean, it's, ah, I love it. A man of the people. Superman makes sense. Do you have a villain that you're most attracted to? I hate to say favorite villain because there's some people that could say you shouldn't, you know, uh, celebrate villains. But is there one in comics that you've always been attracted to? Mm. Boy, that's kind of a a tough question. No, I mean, I guess they always kind of seem like enigmatic and that sort of thing. And and obviously, the time I grew up, probably exposed more to the villains from Batman because there was the Batman TV series and then films. So, uh, you know, Riddler, Joker, you know, those are, I, I would say when I think of classic Batman or classic villains in comics, I I gravitate towards Batman's very iconic villains more than, say, Superman or something like that. And, you know, Lex Luthor, but, you know, the Penguin and the Joker and the Riddler, they all look much cooler than, say, Lex Luthor. (laughs) Right on. Right on. Could we expect Loco Hero to maybe start developing a rogues gallery of her own then? Yeah, I think it's something I need to put some good thought into because even though she exists currently in our world, 
there are certainly some, you know, colorful different characters. And uh, I want to have villains that people can also, I don't want to say associate with, but stick in their mind. You want them to be sort of memorable and say, well, you know, this guy is a guy I love to hate. You know, and there's some uh, villains in certain movies like Rob Roy and things like that. You really want to see these guys die because they're scumbags. And so, uh, yeah, I, I would say that in round two and three in Loco Hero, you would start seeing some more colorful uh, and more right. maybe kind of memorable um, uh, types of characters that would sort of right now need to be fleshed out more. Gotcha. I, I, I love that answer, man. Um, so uh, you've probably had hundreds of thousands of color covers that you've drawn put in front of you by fans. Is there one that when fans put it in front of you and say, sign this, please, Monty, is there one that's your favorite that you just have to stop and say, hey, I remember that and tell the story every time? Or I mean, do you have a favorite cover, I guess? Um, I have some favorites among Lady Death, but I would imagine that if somebody brought me my first ever freelance cover helena and they brought there was two variants for it. one was a pencil drawing and one was a painting i'd probably get a pretty massive charge out of that and a giant grin it doesn't happen very often i i know people that that have them um but i don't often get one brought to me at a show but i would imagine that if, if i would say this is where it began as a freelancer that's awesome man that's awesome. Um, what was the last comic that you put down? What was the last one you read? Ooh. Uh, it was you know, for a project that I'm working on, so it was a Coffin Comics, uh, La Muerta and Hell Witch. You know, usually uh, I always tried to be the artist who would read whatever something was given to me, so I've done a number of novel covers over the years. Uh, I haven't done one in a long time because nowadays they just Photoshop everything together. And they don't necessarily want to go out and hire a traditional artist like they used to. Um, but I would always say, is this a reprint or is the book done? And I would always try to read it. Now, every so often the book wasn't available and they just said, here's the three paragraphs of what you got to work with. Here's what the bad guy could look like or the good guy or the alien. Uh, but I always preferred it when I could read the entire book. And I remember once or twice reading an entire novel in like two, three days just so I could illustrate the cover and not miss my deadline. That's awesome, man. I, I respect when the, uh, when, especially cover artists, they're actually reading the story that they're uh, that they're working on. That's awesome. Um, well, shoot. Uh, <laughs> oh, I, I, I guess I, I I don't have a lot of artists on here, so I don't get to ask this question. We already asked digital or traditional, but being that this is video, I think I have an answer to my question, righty or lefty. And I noticed that you have. You have the the artist sore right there. I mean, I always have a I always had a blister on that same spot, man. That's that's how I, that's how I could tell an artist. <laughs> Good visual acuity if you caught that. But yes, that's an airbrush callus from uh, holding an airbrush, and yep. uh, this is my kind of my trigger finger. And so, uh, yeah, usually you'll kind of see that there. Oh, this one I see. I, actually, that was from over the weekend doing some work. So that oh, one's no. actually not an artist sore. That one's a blister from oh. washing my car. <laughs> oh shoot! I know that when I was a wheel. No, but okay. right next to it on the other side, that's actually uh, there's an artist callus for oh, my yep. airbrush right there. Yep. <laughs> right, right on, right, right on. on. Yeah, so, it's funny because usually I'm working with this hand, and this hand will have like twelve pencils and four markers in it, and so you feel like you're like Wolverine, and you've got all these like crazy things over in your you know left hand that you're totally like grub fisting with all these art tools. It's it's amazing that they haven't developed the, the, the glove yet. That it just sticks, you know, you have your 12 different utensils and you just... Yeah, foam. <laughs> just stab it in there. Yeah, see, the, the, where is that? Where is, ugh, come on, where's the Shark Tank guys at? We, this, this podcast is loaded with ideas. <laughs> An artist drawing glove that they developed it more for use on tablets so your hand slides yeah. around. Yeah, I, I have one of those. It just covers like the pinky and the index finger. Yep. But yeah. usually I'll wear one of those if I'm drawing too because it helps keep uh, the grease, uh, your natural body greases, off of the paper. Uh, and so it just keeps it clean. So I usually wear one of those when I'm drawing. Does it help with the smudges too? Because I know a lot of people just put the, the paper over it. But it does help with smudges? I do that too. Uh, but it keeps the, it, it's kind of twofold. Now, if you pick up some graphite on it, then you need to clean it. Um, but yeah, it just keeps the, the, the real light 
natural grease that we all have just in our skin and pores just keeps it off the paper. Uh, and I'm pretty good about keeping it clean, but I still will usually do like the whole top to bottom, left to right kind of thing. So I'm still not working through what I've drawn. Gotcha. Gotcha. No, that makes sense. That, that makes sense. Uh, man. Um, like, yeah, no, I, I don't think I can ask these other dozen questions I have here. I know you're a busy guy. <laughs> Come back. Maybe we could do another I, one next. That, that's that's kind of what I'm thinking. I think uh, once once Loco Hero's out there and everybody has, or you're welcome on this show whenever you want, Monty. For all I, I mean, you call me tomorrow. We'll do it again. I don't care. <laughs> you uh, catch up, kind of see how the campaign's doing. You could ask yeah. your secondary questions. It could just be part two. Sounds good. Sounds good. Um, well, is there anything else that you want to plug before you go? Where can uh, where can people find you on social media? Um, I'm pretty active on social media, so uh, I do have my main profile page, which is my full name, Monty Michael Moore. So they can send me a friend request there, and then I have an artist page, which is that's the page where you have unlimited friends, uh, and that's Monty M Moore. So it just doesn't have the full middle and middle name. And then uh, my main pop culture website is called Maverick Arts. So you can go to maverickarts.com or mavarts.com for short. It's like the eBay version. Uh, and I'm also Mavarts on Instagram. Uh, I don't post as, awesome, uh, as often on Instagram. I just kind of forget to do it. But I'll usually post on Facebook three to five times per day uh, various art projects, things that are for sale, announcements of you know what shows are coming up, whatnot. So Obviously, for the next 30 days, there's going to be a lot of uh, a lot of behind the scenes for Loco Hero. So last night or the night before, I posted some uh, of Donnie's early layouts. So what? So people, uh, uh, am, uh, amateur artists, uh, fans, friends, could kind of see part of the behind the scenes. You know, and it shows just the word balloons and just body outlines, and it shows you know what they would call breakdowns or layouts. And so I'm trying to dig a little bit deeper into the art and the creation side of things so that the backers get an, a, a glimpse into that and they also know that the amount of work that goes into it for the artists you know even the colorist has to they usually do what they call flats first and that's blocking the colors creating all of their um their masks and things like that and then they go back and put all the pretty stuff in at the end so um i people have always enjoyed the behind the scenes so uh, I usually try to show progress pictures and stuff. So, um, but on any of the social media, you can find me there. Uh, I also have a separate fine art and Western website. It's called the art of And so you can see art that's um, purely Western and native American, but there's also a pop culture side to my Western art. So you'll see art from tombstone and pale rider, uh, the good, the bad, and the ugly. So it's me taking my love of pop culture and then putting a Western slant on it. I love it, man. That's awesome. That's awesome. And I'm going to post all of these links and everything in the, the, the show notes in the description as well. So um, people that are driving, they don't have to pull over to write all this down. They'll be yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's up online, and, and uh, I appreciate you having me on the show today. Uh, I appreciate you coming on. I can't imagine how busy you are. Are you still taking commissions right now too during all this? Uh, only through the Kickstarter. Uh, cool. So in lieu of going to conventions, one of the ideas was if I get the Kickstarter out there, uh, I have several reward tiers. There's sketch covers available, some upper-level paintings. And instead of doing the the convention show commissions, this will allow me to, once the, con- uh, the Kickstarter is over, the campaign's done, then I'll have the through the end of the summer uh, and in early fall to create all the commissions for everybody. Awesome, man. Awesome. Well, Monty, it has been my pleasure having you on the show. I know you're extremely busy. Uh, I, uh, I I can't wait to talk to you again more, man. I wish you the best, and I hope you stay safe during all this. I'm sure you will. I appreciate it. Thanks. And when you see Chuck, tell him I'm going to be reaching out to him. Uh, yeah, I, I, I would imagine. I, you can count on it. <laughs> all right. Well, cheers, Monty. Thank you. Cheers. Thanks for having me on. Well, there you have it. Another creator has been cornered on the Cheers to Comics podcast. And, you know, I got to say, um, I'm pretty proud of this one. Proud of this interview. We got a lot of exclusive stuff. And I never would have thought that, I mean, uh, this is going to sound weird. No, before I completely finish the thought out loud, I was going to say I never would have thought that I could be so drawn to Monty. 
But uh, the, the the thing is, is that goddamn, after actually talking with him beyond just being a fan for years, this guy, uh, uh, he he deserves his legend status. Let's put it that way. And uh, just getting to talk to him, fuck man. I don't know if it's because we're both Denver boys or what's going on, but he uh, he's a hell of a likable person. He's a nice guy, and man, does he have some knowledge to drop on us. Uh, this, this is uh, this is great stuff, and you know, in these unprecedented times, remember that these are the times that Monty Michael motherfucking Moore created his own goddamn comic book too, and then he had it funded uh, ten times the amount within four days on Kickstarter. That's that's what we want to remember about these unprecedented times. So <laughs> there you have it, Monty Michael Moore. What a guy. So, uh, support this podcast. You enjoyed this podcast. You made it this far. I expect nothing less than you to actually support it now. Uh, leave reviews. Five-star reviews are huge. Leave them on Apple. And, uh, yeah, there, there are certain parts throughout this, this podcast where every once in a while I'll fucking get a whole bunch of these reviews together and I'll read them out loud. So, if you want to hear your name and your review read on the show, leave a five-star review. Uh, also on Podchaser as well. Uh, anywhere you could leave feedback. Fucking do it. It helps the podcast. It helps the podcast. Uh, also, Patreon. Patreon.com slash Cheers to Comics. Monty joined. I don't know <laughs> how much more of an endorsement do you need. How much more of an endorsement do you need? Monty Michael Moore is a member of the Slurred Army. You can be, too, for as little as a dollar. Um, and I'm just going to be improving these tiers. I'm actually going to get some teasers printed up here soon, so uh, stay tuned for all that. Um. Uh, yeah, and uh, it'll it'll all be uh, updated on Patreon. So check it out. You're gonna get exclusive ad free content, and uh, yeah, that does it. So I hope you enjoyed this as much as I did. And uh, as always, I remind you, slurds, to read responsibly. Cheers, fuckers. Hi, you're listening to Cheers to Comics podcast. Hey, everyone. I'm Monty Michael Moore, and this is the Cheers to Comics podcast with Brian Wayne. I'm Harrison. I'm Jordan. And And we're we're the Green Green Freedom Freedom Podcast. Podcast. Do you want to listen to the number one gaming podcast on Podchaser? Of Of course course you do. do. Wait, wait. Is that us? Did you check that? There it is. Comedy, gaming, and movies. Join us every Wednesday on the Grief Burrito Podcast. Fuck. No, 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 I'd panic. That was, that was <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs>